This is number six and the final chapter in our six-week undertaking to really get to the heart of the Chayim. I have to say, in all honesty, that this undertaking, when I took it, I did not realize how much it would take out of me. But on the other hand, I also didn't realize how much value it would add in people's lives. But this has been a huge journey. Pretty much my whole week gets focused on Wednesday. What's going to be on Wednesday? Are we going to have what to say on Wednesday? How do we prepare for Wednesday? But it's also allowed me, in my own way, to go and explore the Chag, each Chag, in a, in, in a much more comprehensive way. Usually, you know, it's more, yeah, I get it. Rosh Hashanah is this, Yom Kippur is that, Sukkot is that. But to really get it and understand it in a deeper and more profound way. So what we're going to explore tonight are three major Chagim that are coming up. And you might ask, three major what? Really? Three Chagim? And the answer is yes, three Chagim. There are three major Chagim that are coming up, and it's going to be a big deal, each one of them. And what, what I hope to introduce to you guys tonight is actually the power of these days to really for us to fully comprehend and appreciate the power of the three days that are upon us because something amazing happens in these few days. But unfortunately, all too often, we, we don't really f- tap into the energy of this time. What I find usually, even within myself, is that by the time it comes to this time of the Chag, it's, it's, it's over, man. It's like it's so over. Rosh Hashanah, lead up. Yom Kippur, the lead up. You bought a sukkah, you put it up the sukkah, the lulav, the esrog. Just chill. And then comes these days at the end of the Chag that become very much a afterthought in the eyes of many people. I would say in the eyes of many, you know, most people. People who really take the Chagim seriously see these the, the upcoming days as somewhere between negligible to, okay, if I had a bit more energy, I would go there. But what I hope to, to explore with you tonight is that what's coming up starting from tomorrow night and then concluding on Sunday evening, those three days, Hoshana Rabbah, Shmini Atzeres, and Simchas Torah, in many ways are th- three of the most powerful days of the entire year. And they are the climax rather than the afterthought of the month we're in. It's not three days that demand a lot of us. It's not like, oh gosh, so Rabbi, you're going to start telling me that we have to go to Shul and sit eight hours. It's not that. Let's explore this together. So this year and forever, you are the rabbi. Goals for tonight, Hoshana Rabbah, the most unknown holiday, Shmini Atzeret, Geshem, praying for rain that we do on Shemini Atzeret, Yisker, which we're going to do again, even though we just did it on Yom Kippur, Simchas Torah night, this year as in Saturday night, Simchas Torah day, Sunday morning, Shabbat Bereshit, the week that follows, the Shabbos that follows, and unpacking all that we've learned, which is pretty much the topic of this year. So it's three big days after all. What are these three big days? Let's go one by one. The first one, Hoshana Rabbah. And like the thought that comes to you is like, really? Like Hoshana, what? What happened on this day? So Hoshana Rabbah is the seventh day of Sukkot. Both in Israel and in the diaspora, it's the final day of Sukkot. It's the seventh day. Now, just like Pesach finishes with two days at the end of the Chag in the diaspora one day, in Israel, called Shvi Shal Pesach, the seventh day of Pesach, which is a Chag. This isn't a Chag per se, it's a mini Chag. If you come to Shul on this day, you'll notice that the davening is a balance between regular weekday davening and Chag davening. It's like the one day of the year that's a bit of a challenge because it's a regular day of the week. You can like go work, you can do whatever you need to do, but at the same time, it's a big day. And therefore, um, you'll find that the, the chazan will even wear a kittel 
a white uh, you know garment that they only wore in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur on this day. It's serious business. It's it's big. And the image you see in front of you is a guy taking two willows or five willows actually and whacking it on the floor, which is one of the customs that we do in this day. So let's explore this day. Throughout the whole month, throughout sorry, the, throughout the whole Sukkot, we've been saying Hoshanas. This started from Shabbat this past week, and we've been saying it Shabbos, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was the fifth day. What do we do Hoshanas? So it's a part of davening unique to Sukkot that after Hallel, or sometimes at the end of the service, you take the lul of an esrog, the lul of in your right hand, the esrog in your left hand, and you surround the bima. You surround the, the podium upon which the Torah is read. What is that to commemorate? It's to commemorate the fact that in the time of the temple, the, they used to have a ceremony where they would take very tall willows and wrap the altar with it each of the four corners of the big altar which they made sacrifices they would put these huge many meter tall willows on the corners and then the kohanim would surround it and to commemorate that we go around the bima interesting and it's an anecdote that we didn't mention last week and it's important to mention even shaking the lul of an esrog according to the torah that means if you look in the five books of moshe you'll see that there's only a mitzvah to do it on the first day of Sukkot. You should take for yourself on the first day, not the other six days. The only reason we shake little of six, uh, seven days of Sukkot is because after the destruction of the second temple, the sages felt that they want to recreate as much as possible what happened in the temple. So some of the things that happened in the temple was that they shook the little of all seven days. So that's why ever since the destruction of the second temple, which is relatively recent in the bigger picture of Jewish history, because for 1500 years before the destruction of the second temple, the Jews were only shaking Lulav once a year, one day a year. And ever since the destruction, we do it seven. So too with Hoshanas, which is going around the Bima with your Lulav and Esrik to commemorate what they did in the temple. Again, it's to recreate temples. So, you know, often we think that the temple and the focus on it is something that we do on Tisha B'Av. But the truth is we do it every day. I mean, first of all, the davening is full of it. We, in Amidah, we ask numerous times, bring us back to Zion, bring us back to the temple. But even the fact that we shake a lulav for seven days is temple. The fact that we go around the bima is temple. So each of the six days, we go around the bima once. On Hoshana Rabbah, which means big Hoshana, and Hoshana again meant the ceremony of putting the willows at the corners and surrounding, we go around seven times. And what we do is we go, each day that we went around the bimo, we say a paragraph. Uh, each word in the paragraph is one of the letters of the Aleph Bet. So Hoshana, Elokeinu, Boreinu, Goaleinu, etc. And each word, you say the word Hoshana before and Hoshana after. Etc. And you walked around. Now you do all six paragraphs each time you walk around the bima again to commemorate, commemorate what they did in the temple on the seventh day that they walked around seven times. And then you say many, many verses following that. So Hashanah Rabbah Davening, if it's done in the full version, Often, you know, shuls just for practicality will cut a bit here and there, but if the full version, it could take a solid hour and a half, two hours to do an Hoshana Rabba Davani. And as we see, the word Hoshana means save. So please save us for your sake, Hashem Hoshana. That's what I mean. Hoshana Lamancha Likeinu, Hoshana, Hoshana Lamancha Bareinu, Hoshana. And that's a tune you might recognize in shul. Hoshana Lamancha Gealeinu, Hoshana, Hoshana Lamancha Dersheinu. Hoshana. Now, okay, so Hoshana Rabbi, you go around seven days. But listen to this, seven times. The Medrash tells us that God told Avraham Avinu, our, our patriarch Avraham, if atonement is not granted to your children on Rosh Hashanah, I will grant it on Yom Kippur. If they do not attain atonement on Yom Kippur, it will give, be given on Hoshana Rabbi. That's a biggie. Rosh Hashanah, 
Yom Kippur or Shana Rabba? Are you seeing something? It's literally putting it in the same category. And again, that's why the Chazam will wear a kittel because it is the climax. It's the end of a journey. The prophet Isaiah says, they seek me day after day, referring to God. God says the Jewish people seek me day after day. And the Talmud explains that these two days refer to the day when the shofar is sounded, Rosh Hashanah, and the day when we take the willow, the, the, the willows, and the day when the heavenly judgment begins and the day when it concludes. And that's why even after Yom Kippur, we'll still wish people a gmar tov, things should finish off well. Even though technically they were signed on Yom Kippur, we'll often say a good um, That means you should have a good note. Hashem should, you know, wrap you up in a good way. Hashanah Rabbah is really the climax of the, and that's why right after Hashanah Rabbah, we stop dipping apple, uh, the challah in honey. We, according to various customs, we stop saying with David Hashem Ori Vishi at the end of every davening Shachris and Mincha or Shachris and Marv. And according to other customs, we just wait one more day. We do it on Shemini Atzeret, but practically for the same reason, because it's wrapped up. The, the, so we start saying with David Hashem, chapter 27 in Tehillim. We start saying it the first day of Elul, and the last day we're going to say it is Hoshana Rabbah or Shemini Atzeret, which is in the diaspora, the day that might be the last day of the Chag, as we'll explore in just a few moments. So what kind of observances do we do on this day? The primary observance of Ashana is taking the willow. We take a bundle of five willows, and with it, we strike the ground five times. And kids love this. <laughs> and you're like, you see how many leaves you could knock off the willow? After the bundles used, many have the custom of throwing it on top of the ark. Um, it's, it's done across the world. We've done it. We do it in Leedsville Shell as well. You throw the, if possible, and everybody tries to get it on the first aim, um, to get the five willows on. You take five willows. Um, I usually buy them. They're, they're sold around town. And this fellow gets them for me every year. Put them around with a rubber band and you hit them. And that's the major custom. And the custom is according to many to do it for children as well. So I bring it. My wife and I will do it each one. I'll do it in shul, but then I'll bring it home. And then all our children are either we're going to do it on their behalf. It's just a nice, wonderful custom. And often I throw it on top of the sukkah once it's done. Another interesting custom is night learning. Many people will stay up Hoshana Rabbah night and literally learn throughout the night. It even mentions it in halacha in Jewish law, the idea of Ne'orim Kalalayla to stay up. Interesting, each Chag of the three major Chagim, Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot, have a night that many people have a custom to stay up the whole night. Shavuot is the most famous, Tikkun Lel, where we stay up the whole night the first night of Shavuot. Pesach, the custom is on the seventh night of Pesach, which we referred to earlier, the culmination of Pesach. That's the night that commemorates the splitting of the sea, and which happened early morning, so we kind of stay up to greet the splitting of the sea. And Hoshana Rabbah. And there's various customs. For example, one custom that uh, is a Chabad custom, but done, I believe, in many other communities, is comes midnight, we sit down and say the whole Tehillim. So tomorrow, let's say 12.05 a.m., tomorrow night, um, they'll, usually there'll be a minion. I don't know if this year there'll be a minion just because of COVID, but usually I'll drive to Torah Academy and we'll sit for an hour and a half and we'll say the Tillam. Um, in other places when midnight is one o'clock and when you do it at one o'clock, the reason you only do it at midnight is because you're not allowed to say Tillam in general in the evening. I think that's pretty well known that from sunset, or nightfall till midnight, we don't say Tehillim. Just not the energy for Tehillim, unless there's obviously somebody desperately ill and in very unique circumstances like Yom Kippur or Shoshana, but in general, we don't. So we wait till midnight and we learn, uh, we say Tehillim. Many people have a custom that before they say the whole Tehillim, they read the whole book of Dvarim, which is one of the uh, one full fifth of the, of the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah. That's a custom that I do. So literally it'll take two hours tomorrow night, just to sit there going through the whole Chumash Devarim, it's a lot. Then at 12 o'clock to go through the whole Tehillim. Again, because this is like a mini Yom Kippur. It's, 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 it's the wrap, and we take this very seriously. Another custom that people do is that they'll give out honey cake, just like they give out honey cake on the day before Yom, uh, Yom Kippur, telling people it should be a sweet year. So to Hashanah Rabbah, 
Lubavitcher Rebbe used to give out lekach twice every um, Tishrei, once on the day before Yom Kippur, and on Hashanah Rabbah for those who didn't get the first time. Another custom that's widespread across all Jewish communities, I believe, is we have a festive meal. We actually sit down sometime during Hashanah Rabbah, usually about noon, and we'll have, we wash, we have challah, dip it in honey for the last time. And if you, mentioned, you remember, I mentioned a, a while ago that we also, there's this food called kreppel. And a kreppel is, uh, I mentioned it, but regarding Yom Kippur, it's dough filled with ground beef or chicken. And basically it symbolizes the, that beauty sometimes is hidden in something else. And remember the other time we, we ate kreppels is before Yom Kippur when people, the custom is to get hit, malchus, to get 39 lashes as atonement. And again, this time we're hitting the willow. And on Purim, we hit Haman. So the three times that we hit, we uh, show that basically within the, within the pain in life, within the hitting of life is meaning as well. So that this is some of the customs that we have during this time. Okay, so now we move on. Hashanah Rabbah. Now, we spoke about this in the past regarding Rosh Hashanah, that pretty much every Chag that in Israel is one day, in the diaspora's two days. And that's because once upon a time, the Jewish calendar was set up through witnesses who came and saw the birth of a new moon. They would come and say, ah, the new moon, so it's Rosh Chodesh today. And they, the Beth then would declare Rosh Chodesh at the time. The problem was that people who lived in far-flung areas weren't able to find out when Rosh Chodesh is. Often it would take weeks. And therefore, each Chag was always given two days, just in case Rosh, Rosh Chodesh was a day earlier or a day later, we commemorated. Even after we have a set calendar, which was put up not too long after the destruction of the Second Temple, the sages felt to continue that custom that people who live in the diaspora have what's called Yom Tov Sheni Shal Goliyos, a second Yom Tov, a second Chag of exile. Now, two days Pesach in the beginning, two days Pesach at the end, two days Shavuot, two days Sukkot at the beginning. The problem with Sukkot at the end, however, is because Sukkot then leads into another Chag. It's the only Chag that leads to another Chag, which is Simchas Torah, the, the joyous day. So you kind of are in limbo because the Simchas Torah Chag needs two days and the Sukkot Chag needs two days to wrap it up. So what exactly goes on over here? Which days are Shana Rabbah, etc.? So basically, what you have in the diaspora is the day between Hashanah Rabbah and Simchas Torah is a day called Shmini Atzeret, the eighth day. And it's a mixture of the previous Chag and the upcoming Chag. It's a, it's a mixture of the Sukkot, it's rounding up Sukkot, and it's also bringing in Simchas Torah. And I'll show you how that works. It's not theoretical. On Shmini Atzeret, we eat in a Sukkah, but we don't make the bracha, Leishe Sukkah, to sit in a Sukkah. Because again, it might be the last day of Sukkot, but on the other hand, it might be the first day of Simchas Torah and we don't want to really interfere too much. So sitting in a Sukkah doesn't really interfere with the new Chag, but for example, shaking the lul of an Esrug would feel like we're intruding on a new Chag, so we don't do it. So we sit in a Sukkah, but we don't make a bracha leishu basukkah. In Israel, they don't sit in a Sukkah on the last day because again, Hoshana Rabbah was the last day of Sukkot, and Simchas Torah, they go into the new Chag. We have this middle day in between that kind of is borrowed for both Chagim. There's different customs. For example, there is a Hasidic custom that Hakafot, which is dancing around with the Torah, is done not only on Simchas Torah, but done on Shemini Atzeris as well, because that's the prelude day. The Ashkenaz custom is not to. But we nevertheless do various things which are similar to Simchas Torah. For example, in the Amidah, we don't refer to the day anymore as Sukkot. We refer to it as Shmini Atzeret. So it's a limbo day. Now, in Israel, they have a lot to pack into this day. They, Shmini Atzeret has to be the day that they start praying for rain, as we'll explore in a moment. It's the Yiskor, it's Simchas Torah, it's Hakafot, it's, it's everything. In the diaspora, it's split over two days, which just gives a little more breathing and a lot more fun, depending what your definition of fun is. So what does Shmini Atzeret actually mean? Shmini means eighth, by Yom HaShmini, the eighth day. And Atzeret means stop. And the Medrash tells us that what that means is that we explored last week that the, 
throughout Sukkot, 70 sacrifices were brought in the temple. And those 70 sacrifices were in honor of the 70 nations. So we, we kind of honored all the various different nationalities and, and ways of life in the world. But then God comes and says, okay, now I want one day just me and the Jewish people. Anivata, me and you. Hashem says, Atzeret, wait, wait, before you guys go home, we had Rosh Hashanah, we had Yom Kippur, we had Sukkot. I'm asking for one last chai. I'm asking for one last day with you. And that's what Shemini Atzeret means. It means Hashem comes and says, stay with me. Another translation of the word Atzeret is La'atzor, to, to gather in. Because as we, we're exploring now, this is the time that the whole culmination of the, of the month or the last six, seven weeks culminates and at sorry, you bring it in. Hashem turns to us and says, stay just one more day. Just him and us. What does Shmini Yatzeret feature? What, what will happen practically on this year, Friday night, Shabbos, Hoshana Rabbis, Thursday night, Friday and Shmini Yatzeret is Friday night Shabbos. So, as I said, some people have the custom that Friday night they're going to actually have hakafot. They're going to have the dancing around with the Torah around the bima. First time. I grew up that way. Obviously, now in the Ashkenaz Shul, that's not the custom, so we don't do it. Then there is the special prayer for rain, which is known as the prayer of Geshem. Geshem means rain, but interesting, Geshem means more than rain. Whenever we refer to physical things, it's called Gashmi of Geshem. So it's not only a prayer for rain, it's a prayer for abundance. One thing I forgot to mention regarding Oshana Rabba is there's a lot of prayers about rain on that day as well, because between Oshana Rabba and Shemini Atzeres, this day, this time, it's very much, we're told Hashem judges us on the rain and wraps up our judgment, specifically when it comes to our parnasa and, the, and whatever we need, abundance from heaven. So there's a big focus on rain, both on Oshana Rabba and on Shemini Atzeres. It commemorates the start of the Mediterranean as an Israeli rainy season. Us in South Africa, we're a bit upside down with the seasons, but the truth is over here, it's also the, in Joburg, at least the beginning of the rainy, rainy season as well. Another thing we do is Yisker. And there was a thought that I actually shared in the shul a few years ago, and it's that kind of resonated with a few and people remind me about it. And that is, I, I asked the question, it's my own, you could take it or leave it, throw it out. It's unique that we do Yisker so close to one another. We just had a Yisker on Yom Kippur and a Yisker on Shemini Atzeret. And obviously the reason is because it's a big Chag. Sukkot is a big Chag. But there has to be meaning in the fact that just 10 days ago we did Yisker and, and 10 days later we do Yisker as well. And what I suggested, and I, I believe it to be true, is that there's two kinds of Yiskars in life. There's a Yisker of pain and there's a Yisker of joy. I'll be honest, until I started this year, this, the, Tonight, 8 o'clock, I was in a very, very hectic space. Thank God the sheer, the Torah we're learning together is liberating me. But, um, you know, one of the people who were on this group and a, a, a good, good person passed away from COVID this morning. And it really, it, it took me. And it's been a hard day. And there's two kinds of yiskers. There's two kinds of ways of thinking of people who passed away a yisker that brings to sadness, which is, or seriousness, which is the Yom Kippur energy, and a yisker that brings to joy. In other words, wow, I was so lucky to have that person in my life. Memories, fun memories, exploring. And I was talking to her, one of her grandchildren today, and she's like, you know, Rabbi, what I'm telling myself is if my grandmother died on Sukkot, and it's a Zman Sim Chasenu, time of joy, then she wants me to be happy, which I thought was, what an incredible, uh, challenge to put on oneself. We're here, Yisker on Shemini Atzeres is a different energy than the Yisker of Yom Kippur. It's an energy of fond memories, peaceful memories. Technically, we would do Yisker on the last day of the Chag Simchas Torah, but most people are drunk, or many people are drunk, and it's just inappropriate with the vibe of the day. So Yisker is done on Shemini Yatzeret. We, as we said, we no longer take the four kinds. We no longer mention Sukkot in the davening, but we still eat in the sukkah, but without a blessing. 
that's pretty much what Shemini Atzeret will look like. Another custom, the Ashkenaz custom, depending on the year. If there is a Shabbos within Sukkot, within the, the intermediate days of Sukkot, it would be done then. But this year, Shabbos was only the first day of Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret. There was no Shabbos in between. So the book of Kohelet, with Exiliastes, from King Solomon is read. And that's very much a meditation. I encourage you to read it sometime on Shabbos. It's, again, it's the kind of book that could either be depressing, like a Yisker, or it could be a very encouraging book, uh, a read, like the other kind of Yisker. Pretty much King Solomon, who had a thousand wives. Yeah, genius. And um, abundance and everything he needed comes and says, everything is just folly. Everything's just a waste. It's all, it's all empty. And it's a 10 chapter, if not even longer, maybe 12 chapter meditation on, on how life without spirituality is empty. But it's not written by a guy, you know, like a dude that was hanging around in the physical world for the past 20 years. I was so materialistic. And then COVID came. It's not written in 2020. It's written by the guy who built the first temple. We're talking 3,000 year old book of somebody who pretty much his definition of physical was maybe a little less sophisticated than our physical. Although he was a king, he didn't have technology, but at some stage after having all the gold in the world, all the wisdom in the world, he was, a, he was the wisest man, et cetera. He comes up and he actually realizes it's all empty. <clears throat> at the end of the day, that's Mitzvah Shav Shemur. Fear God, keep his mitzvahs, because this is all that the human being is about. <clears throat> For those who light a Yisker candle, they'll um, light it on just before Shabbos. Obviously, you cannot light it on Shabbos, so you light it um, when you light Shabbos candles Friday night. Um, the candle lighting is just like the candle lighting that we had at the beginning of Sukkot. Baruch Hashem, Elokeinu Ladlik Ner Shel Shabbat Veshel Yom Tov, as a Shabbos and Yom Tov, and then the Shechianu. <clears throat> Festive meal both at night, Yom Tov meal, it's a Yom Tov, and festive meal by day. After davening finishes, etc., about 12 in the day, we sit down and we have a meal in the sukkah. There's a custom, it's actually a, a wide custom, including in the Ashkenaz community to say farewell to the sukkah. There's actually a text. If you find out, if you see the art scroll machzor for Sukkot, there's a whole text that's, writ, that's read as people say goodbye to the sukkah. What pretty much happens is at some stage in the afternoon, just before Shemini Atzeres comes to an end, people go in um, and say goodbye to sukkah. My father, may he rest in peace, had very neat customs on Sukkot. I think I mentioned it last week, his bottle of vodka never left the table for eight days straight. The only difference was it was always, a, every morning it was a different bottle. So his custom of saying goodbye to the sukkah was he would go with his buddies to a sukkah somewhere and they would down a few gazunta bottle uh, cups of vodka one after another. Nobody will ever drink like my dad. Um, and I think that's a good thing. <laughs> and he, um, yeah, that's the way he said goodbye. Other people say goodbye by reading various texts, by just eating a nice meal. But the custom is sometime at the end of Shemini Atzeres, you say goodbye to the sukkah. And as the custom is to say that, please God, we should sit in the sukkah of Mashiach. We're told when Mashiach comes, when the Redeemer comes, we'll sit in the sukkah of Yasan, the sukkah that's made out of the skin of the Leviathan um, fish that officially we're going to get to eat the fish and we'll be surrounded by its skin when Mashiach comes. Now, this is a very powerful statement. It's most probably, um, for me, the most defining statement of what Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is about. Rabbi Shalom Dober Lubavitch, who was the fifth Chabad Rebbe, passed away in 1920, 100 years ago. He said the following. He says, the 48 hours of Shemini Atzeret Sitzim Kastara should be highly treasured. Every moment is an opportunity to draw buckets and barrelfuls of material and spiritual treasures. And how? We dance it. that the mitzvah of Shemini Atzeret Simchas Torah, the mitzvah of the day, is dancing. Not to sit in shul and, you know, cry in the book, to dance. But in many ways, it's much harder. 
Because let's be honest, dancing is for idiots. What do I mean? Come on, you know it, cool people. Well, if they're really cool and they have good moves, then they dance. But pretty much any cool person who doesn't have good moves is not on the dance floor. You stand on the side, you look at all, all those people dancing the horror in the middle, and you know, you're checking your phone, you're calling your husband from the other side of the mechitza, honey, calling your wife, you're trying to figure out what to do next. Dancing is not easy unless you really, you really enjoy dancing and if it's your vibe. And that's why in many ways, the avoda, the, the, work, the service of Hashem through dancing, depending for who, is very hard. For me personally, it's very hard. Not because I think it's foolish, but I'm just not a dancer. I don't, I don't express uh, my joy that way. I express it through comedy. I'll express it through um, you know, sitting together, having a fabring and sitting around the table. But dancing is hard. But that's the mitzvah of the day. Hashem says, move. There's a famous story that's told that it's, it's like, it's, it's not a story, but a, rather a, a message that on Simcha's Torah morning, the angel Michael one time showed up in heaven in God's chamber and he sees a bunch of ripped shoes. And he asks, what in the world are ripped shoes doing in God's chamber? And the answer was, these are the shoes that ripped from Jews who danced all night. In other words, Hashem wants ripped shoes by the time Sukkot Torah is finished. He wants us to, to get it, to dance, to dance, to, to fully, fully, fully get involved, dance and more dance. And I want to share a few memories that I have of this day in my childhood. <clears throat> I had a unique childhood in many ways. And what was most unique about it is that it was in the shadow of the Lubavitcher Rebbe just before the Rebbe got sick and passed away. I was only seven and a half when he got sick and I was a month before my 10th birthday when he passed away. So it was very much the, 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 the foundational years of my childhood. But And there were many unique experiences about it. Incredible, I mean, you know, living four blocks away, my father would schlep me to every single opportunity to be with the Rebbe. Every Shabbos I would sit at this for bring him for hours watching him um, go by him to get dollars, etc. But the main memory I have, or the most meaningful memory, is Simchas Torah. Because Simchas Torah was a climax. It was an unreal experience. And when I mean unreal, I literally mean it's unreal. 10,000 people packed into a chamber, a room that could only fit 2,000, and the Rebbe goes like this, and we jump. And the Rebbe goes like this, and we jump. And I would sit right where the Rebbe, I might have mentioned this last week, I, I sat right where the Rebbe would walk by with his Torah. Basically, he would always down in the front of the shoulder, and he would come to dance in the middle, and the place where he danced was surrounded by tables in the shape of a square, and I sat on it. So he would literally walk right by me, and I would kiss the Torah while it's in his hand. And you saw what joy could look like. You saw. The place was mad. Just, you saw a spiritual person. You saw a real Jew. And we're all real Jews. But you saw a Jew who lives their Judaism in the most authentic way. The face shining with joy from the day. And encouraging dancing. And, and the place danced for hours and hours and hours. In this spot, because you couldn't move. You are just chanting up and down. And till today, in, in Crown Heights, although the Rebbe's passed away, you know, over 25 years ago, there's still a strong energy, but it's not like what it was. And sometimes when, like, I, I'm trying to inspire myself, Simchas Torah, I take myself back to being a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, sitting over there on that table with my legs crossed because the second I stuck my legs over the table, the kids who were sitting under the table start tickling, um, sitting over there and just witnessing thousands of people touching an ounce of real joy. I, I have never seen a joy more authentic than that. And I can't imagine I ever will unless the Mashiach comes and we get to experience the joy when Mashiach comes. It was, was magical, just stunning, absolutely stunning. 
And I have to say that <clears throat> Simchas Torah was also very, it was a day of a deep bonding. You know, my father would bring me each, day, each year to, to that spot. He would squeeze himself. He had to face the table. He actually had to have a pillow in front of him. Otherwise, his, his body would just be smashed from all the weight of thousands of people on top of him. And I don't know why I'm sharing this, but interesting anecdote. Last year, Simchas Torah was the first Simchas Torah my father, uh, since my father passed away. And besides the day my father passed away and on the flight to there, I didn't cry. My tears were locked. In general, I really struggled to cry. Uh, my emotions get expressed otherwise, but I, I, I just can't cry. Not because I think big boys don't cry, I just can't. Um, or not ready for it. And at some stage, Simcha's Torah last year, we were dancing in Shul. And suddenly, like, my father came up in my mind. And it was actually the joy of the moment and the contrast and the memories of, you know, doing some Torah with him as a child that I literally had to walk over to somebody in the shul and say, take over, I'm out. And I walked into my office and sat down and bawled my eyes out for 20 minutes, which is, like, uncontrollable. And then was finally able to gain my composure and come back. And for me, what was so strange and meaningful about it was that it was only joy that was able to actually release my emotion. It was the first time I actually felt like I could release some of the emotion. This was eight months after my dad died, to release and just feel in the moment. So what does a Simchas Torah evening look like? A Simchas Torah evening looks like... Um, that, sorry about that. A Simchas Torah evening means that a bunch of people come to shul and you do what's called hakafot after marriage. Hakafa literally means around. That's what hakafa means, go, go, go around. Lakof. And lakif. And you dance around the bimah. The day before you were dancing around the bimah or, not, or walking around the bimah with aravot, with willows, and now you're walking around with Torahs. And the custom is you take all the Torahs out and you honor people and each hakafa, you dance for a few times around, you sing a song or two, you bring the Torahs back into the ark, you take them back out, read a few verses, go around, read a few verses, go around, all following the alphabetical order. And it's, it starts off with reading the paragraph Atareso, which is 17, 18 verses that talk about God's greatness and the Torah's greatness. And how long our cuff has to be? Well, this year in COVID, we'll find out. You pretty much have to walk around the, the bimah once. You try to create a vibe. I'll be honest, I think the hardest hug ever, unless you have everybody ungeschlachet with the um, you know, whiskey. It's a very hard hug because you're trying to get people to dance. There's no live music. It's a bunch of tunes that they don't know. So it's like there's a limit how many times people could dance to Am Yisrael Chai before they're falling off their feet out of boredom. And in general, people don't enjoy dancing, as we mentioned. So Sukkot and Simchas Torah, it really pulls. Uh, a rabbi has to be really creative to figure out a way. And I'll be honest, I haven't found a way. Um, to really create that energy. So you offer big brachas and people eat and people socialize and they drink whiskey. But the main mitzvah of the day is to dance and everybody's doing everything other than dancing. Um, so first of all, the lesson is learn some Jewish tunes. Uh, you know, so you're not that awkward standing over there trying to figure out what the beat is. And yeah, and, and release ourselves. But this year, you have a break. If you don't enjoy dancing, you're fantastic. It's pretty much because of COVID, you can't pass Torahs around. Some shuls are wrapping Torahs in plastic this year and going to sanitize the plastic and then pass it around. I, I don't know, it just that doesn't resonate with me. Um, so one person will take a Torah, two people will take a Torah, they'll walk around the bimah once, hakafa one. Walk around the bimah twice, hakafa two. Only one person can sing, hakafa three. Kafa four, kafa, et cetera. The kids will come in, they'll do a dance or something. A kafa five, six, seven, you'll be out before you before you know it. Um, but a kafas can, when I, uh, I'm talking about my memories, sorry, sorry I'm getting very nostalgic. Um, a kafas, when I grew up by the Rebbe, would only start because he would encourage everybody to go walk to other communities to bring a chius to them, to bring, you know, energy. 
And he would only start Hakafas at 10.30 p.m. And that, pa that paragraph, Ataresa, in the Ashkenaz custom is said once. Over there in, in the Chabad custom, it's said three times. And each verse is honors somebody else. So by the time you actually start dancing, the first dance, it's 11.30. And it would go easily till 1.32 in the morning. That was the formal part. And then people would dance till the rest of the night. So Simchas Torah is a night of dancing. It's not the night like, okay, honey, can we go home already? This is so awkward. Why did we show up? Every year, it's the same story. I have guys who, like, I beg them, please, David, just show up to Simchas Torah. Please just show up. Okay, Rob, fine, I'll come. The guy comes, standing over there holding a whiskey, chatting to his friend about the stock market or about Man United, trying to figure out what to do. Oh, thank God they finally serve the meat. He has a piece of, uh, you know, beef and turns around and says, okay, cheers. See you tomorrow, Rabbi, or see you next Shabbos. That, I'm not sure why I came here. But it's the kind of night that if you get in the vibe, it can actually be meaningful. It, it's hard to get into it, I agree. Um, and last year we tried to have women go downstairs and dance in their, and have their own simple Torah. Few women, uh, you know, were interested, but I would encourage it. You know, go, go. You know, just, just watching men dance that doesn't exactly, uh, you know, trigger your happiness. Let's let's have women dancing with pleasure in their, you know, in their own space. And it's it's simchat liyot yehudi. It's a joy of being Jewish friends. What does a simchas Torah day look like? By the way, one follow thing on the Simchas Torah night, the Ashkenaz custom is at the end, we actually read Torah, which is very unusual. We never read Torah at night, only by day. We read the final chapter of the Torah, Vizot Bracha. We read three Aliyot. We honor a Kohen, a Levi, a Yisrael, and we then return the Torah to the Ark, which is a unique custom only done in Simchas Torah and Ashkenaz custom. Comes the morning, Simchas Torah morning, and usually every day, Every Chag, you have Birchat Kohanim, the Kohanim bless the people. And when does that usually happen? By Musaf. Problem is, Musaf said the end of Davening. And Hakafot, dancing around, happens by day as well between Chakras and Musaf. So, and people drink. <laughs> so, because we're scared the Kohanim will be drunk, and a drunk Kohen is not allowed to do Birchat Kohanim, it's the only time we do Birchat Kohanim in the Chakras, which is the first service of the day. So, practically, you come, um, Davening will. will that usually would start in theory at 8.30, and by 9.30, the Kohanim already done Birchat Kohanim. You go into Hallel, uh, and then custom around the world, you make Kiddush. Usually you wait to make Kiddush after the whole service. But Simchas Torah, you make the Kiddush then. Again, this year because of COVID, that's not practical. But you make the Kiddush then, and you drink. 10.30 in the morning, you drink. 11 o'clock. And then starts Hakafot. And again, my memories of childhood of the day Hakafot are just unreal joy. But even, even, even the past few years on Linksfield Show, the day is different. You know, the people that come at the day are people who are not coming so much out of obligation, but more because they want to. So it's, even though it's a very small crowd, it's easier to get them uh, riled up, and maybe people aren't as tired, uh, you know, tired. So they, they, we we dance, um, we sing, we drink, and after finishing hakafot, we then go into the Torah reading. And this is an important part. So I, I just want to explore with you for a few minutes because I think it's very often misunderstood. The Torah has 53 parashiyot. It actually has 54, but, but two of them are considered one. <clears throat> so 53 parashiyot. Each year, the goal is to read every single parsha. Sometimes if it's a leap year, you'll read each parsha as singular, not combined. And if it's not a leap year, so you ha you're missing a month, you only have a 12-month year, not a 13-month year, you'll combine very often parashiyot to catch up. But what will always happen is that Simchas Torah, you'll finish and start the new cycle. You'll finish cycle and start the new cycle. And you'll follow that cycle throughout the year. Now, 
you'll read the story of Exodus. It will be three months before Pesach. But you're going to follow the cycle because that's where you're holding. You're holding the Parsha of Shemot. So whenever people say, like, you know, the Parsha of the week, the rabbi will get up and say the Parsha of the week. I often wonder if people actually understand what does that even mean? What's the Parsha of the week? Just, you know, I was looking for some speech material. No, it means that in the order of the 53 Parshas, we've read so far X, and inevitably this Shabbos is Parsha X. Now, obviously, if a Chag comes, a Chag has its own Torah reading, so it kind of interferes, then you catch up after. But pretty much, you can, you can know the cycle. You could just know, okay, Bracious, followed by Noah, followed by Lech Lecha, followed by Vayera. It's just that's the way it goes. Sometimes it maybe have an extra maftir because it's a Rosh Chodesh or it's Hanukkah, etc. But the Torah reading, on the most part, unless it's like a major Chag, never moves. It goes. So Simcha's Torah is the time when we wrap up the Torah reading. So although Shavuot is the Chag that we celebrate the giving of the Torah, Simcha's Torah, we celebrate the fact that we learned the Torah. It's a very different Chag. And that's why Shavuot is not such a jolly day. But Simcha's Torah, we put in the effort. On Shavuot, the Torah was handed to us. On Simcha's Torah, we spent a year learning for it. And that's actually why I posted on the group uh, yesterday, we're launching this new uh, program to go through the entire Torah in the next year, five to 10 minutes every single day. Because what the, what's so important about going through the Torah in one year, besides all the incredible spiritual stuff, is it gives you context. The problem is very often we show up to Shul, I don't know, once a month, we read the Parsha, we follow in the art scroll or the Hirsch or the whatever, and we're like, What's the context? What's going on? And you come back year after year, but the, the Torah is just like a hodgepodge. There's sacrifices, there's Isaac and Jacob, there's Joseph, there's Moses, the Jews complaining in the desert. But if you could go through it consistently over one year, you actually grasp it. And that's one of the, you know, I've been doing it for many years in my life, is each day learn the chumash of the day, because each parsha has seven aliyot. So each day learn one aliyah, with the Rashis on that Aliyah. So, for example, today is Wednesday. And this, on Sunday, Shabbos, we're going to reach Minyat Saras reading, but Sunday is going to be Vizot HaBracha. So this is the week of Vizot HaBracha. So I read the fourth Aliyah in the final chapter of the Torah, parish of the Torah, Vizot HaBracha, happened to be a relatively short Aliyah. Sometimes the Aliyah could be very long, and obviously we're going to try to squeeze it into a small amount of time. But... You, you go through the Torah. Each day of the year, you're learning another aliyah of the Torah. So you're literally learning scripture every single day. So on Simcha's Torah, you're finishing the final chapter. That's what happens. You're finishing the parsha of Zosah Bracha, which is actually quite a short parsha, very short. Just over 40 psukim, 40 verses. And what happens is the custom is to give everybody aliyot. So you'll read the Torah many times over and over, over which you can never usually do. Sometimes... You can add an aliyah. Different shuls have different customs. If you can add aliyahs, how many shuls, how many aliyahs you can add? It's a barmi, etc. But on Simchas Torah, everyone gets aliyahs. What happens if you have a shul with thousands of people? It's not practical. So you call up thousands of people together. Um, I was talking to a rabbi in Yeshiva College. That's what they do every year. I think Lixfield Shul, we don't because it's not such a large crowd. But in theory, you get you say, okay, Kohen, all the Kohanim get called up by your friend. So I, I used to have a custom, you know, when I davened in Brooklyn, Crown Heights. So I would get an aliyah on some Torah. I'll choose whatever aliyah. I'm a, I'm a Yisrael. I'm not a Kohen or a Levi. My name is Levi, but I'm not a Levi. And I couldn't kiss the Torah because it's too far. And when you get an aliyah, you're supposed to kiss the Torah, pre-COVID days. So my custom, I don't do it in Linksfield because people will, you know, like, uh -huh. but I used to find the guy next to me and give the guy a kiss. Because that's the Torah. Who's the Torah on Simcha's Torah? My fellow Jew. The, 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 and if it was a random Israeli who I never met before, I would say, Chak Sameach, give him a big kiss on his cheek, make a bracha, and then turn to the, my left at the end of the Aliyah and kiss another Jew and make the final bracha. That was my Simcha's Torah custom. It stopped when I, when I uh, came to Africa. It's a good custom, but uh, you know, it's each place with its own uh, quirks. And 
everybody gets an aliyah. You could call up, as I said, thousands of people together. It's quite inspiring to hear a thousand people. Baruch et Hashem HaBarach, Baruch Hashem HaBarach Le'olam Vahid, etc. Then we have a unique thing called Kolana Arim. That is the aliyah that kids could get called up. Various shuls will call up boys and girls. Um, whoever wants, pretty much any kid can be called up to Nalia. There's one adult that represents them. In other words, that stands with them and makes the bracha. So at least there's one person over by mitzvah. But everyone gets called up. You bring your children and they get called up. Yamod, and I'll call up all my children. I'll try to get someone else to call up my children. But all the children to come and stand on the bima, and we cover them with a talis and we sing Hamalach HaGoel. Hamalach HaGoel just a, a prayer for our children, you know, Zakeni, Legadel, Banim. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful um, moment of, uh, of Jewish pride and Jewish continuity. Then there's two big aliyot. There's the Chasen Torah aliyah and the Chasen Bracious aliyah. What is that? Well, we need to educate because that's the only way we could fundraise off it. Not just kidding. Um, Chasen Torah is the final aliyah of the, of the Torah, the final one. And Chasam Bracious is the first one of Bracious, of the beginning. So it's the first Aliyah of restart. So Chasam Torah wraps the Torah, Chasam Bracious starts. And the, according to Jewish law, you're supposed to give it to dignitaries and people who you know, are respected in the community and to donors. I know sometimes people say, you know, like you just spoil the donors and it's not fair. And, but there are certain times that even according to Torah, you, you give an honor and the person's supposed to be charitable. The custom is that whoever gets Chasam Torah, Chasam Bracious, will sponsor the bracha and sponsor something big for the shul. Often, chas and torah, and rachis can be sold in locations. I've been one time in the shul where they sold chas and torah for $100,000. Um, it's big stuff. And to have the honor, is, a, is it's a big prestige. You get a whole call up. Usually it's yamod, so-and-so, ben so-and-so, but over here it's a whole thing. And Mishus, with permission of everybody who's here, we call this person up. It's a whole thing. Different shuls have their customs. Uh, rabbi Greg Bank, our former youth rabbi, brought in the custom of dressing people up. And he would come with the weirdest costumes each year. And uh, the Chassan Torah, Chassan Bracious, if they were brave enough, they would, get, they would dress up in it. Um, some shuls keep it a secret who the chas and Torah, chas and Bracious, and everyone's curious. But each shul with their place, some people will combine. You could have 50 chas and Torahs, whatever, as long as each person puts the money in, puts in the dough, you get chas and Torah as well, etc., etc., each place with their thing. But it's a, it's a prestigious honor. And even according to halacha, the customers, they then sponsor the bracha. So kol on the arim is the youth, chas and Torah is the final aliyah. We wrap it up and then just like the end of all five books of Moshe, whenever we finish the five books of Moshe, so there's five books, so it's, let's say, every three, two to three months of the year, we'll finish another book. The final Aliyah, it's called Aliyah of Chazak. Be strong. Chazak, Chazak, and Chazak. And just after the Torah finishes the reading, he goes like this. So the final words of the Torah is, Le'ne kol Yisrael. And everyone screams, Chazak, Chazak, Vinis Chazak. Strong, be strong. We'll all be strength. In other words, we just finished the book. Let's do it again. And then the, and the Balkara will repeat it. It's like a climax. Then do Hagba. We pick up the Torah, open the next Torah. Great shit. All the way. By the way, to roll a Torah from the end to the beginning, it's a mission and a half. And actually, it's very hard, especially in COVID days. They use some, I, I want to roll it by myself. I don't want to affect anybody. Oof. To roll a turf from back to front by yourself. So they have rollers. We're going to get one sometime soon. But it's a serious exercise. It is a mission. It's a good, from one side of the tour to the next, it's a good 15-minute endeavor of solid. Even if you're doing it with two people, just rolling and rolling and rolling. It's a, it's a think of to write a Torah takes a year. It's a, it's a serious amount of parchment, a serious amount of ink. It's a real, uh, it's, a, it's a thing. It's a chapsa. And we then read Bereshit. And we have an interesting custom in the Jewish world that the first Aliyah of Bereshit is the seven days of creation, six days of creation plus Shabbat. And what happens is as the Balkara, as the Torah reader finishes off each day, everyone answers. It was evening, it was morning that the Sunday, 
That's what the Torah actually says. We just read it. Then he, he talks about what happened on Monday. Monday. And then when he comes to Shabbat, the Torah actually, the paragraph is the paragraph that we say each week in Kiddush. So then the community will do it. And everyone will read it, and then Bakar will read it, and then we read the Maftir and Haftorah, etc. So the, it's an end, followed by a beginning, and yes, it's a, it's, it, it's, it brings wealth and abundance, all these uh, beautiful customs. You know, there's the famous joke uh, that if chasen Torah and chasen Bracious lead to wealth, or wealth leads to chasen Torah and chasen Bracious, chances are it's both. But in, in Leeds Vichel, we have had a beautiful custom that each year um, we've always honored somebody of means, but one of the, the other aliyahs, the chasen Torah, would let's say get the person of means, the chasen Bracious would go to somebody of, who volunteered, who did great work of volunteering towards the shul, um, because both are necessary to keep a shul going. So my question to you, just before we wrap up, is did you join the new group? You can go back on the DIY and see a link to join the group. I'll post it again later tonight. And you could join to study the entire Torah in the coming year. And then comes Shabbos Bresha. Shabbos Bresha will be not the Shabbos, because the Shabbos is still Sukkot. Sunday will be Simchas Torah, and Shabbos will be Shabbos Bresha. And it's a big Shabbos. It's the first Shabbos. It's the first Torah portion that you read the whole thing. You read all about creation and Adam and Eve and the sin of the tree of knowledge and Cain killing Abel. It's a very packed parsha. It's quite a, eventful. And it's said in the name of the Tzemach Tzedek, great sage, that the way one conducts himself on Shabbos Bereshit sets the tone for the entire year. Like a caboose following a long railroad train, this Shabbos helps us collect the spiritual energy of the past month, ensuring that we remain on track for the long haul ahead. So Shabbos Bereshit is, is a Shabbos that you show up and show. You show up and you participate and you you set the tone for the rest of the Shabbos. It's the first Shabbos post-holidays, post-Chagim, first normal Shabbos, and we set the tone. And there's a verse that the Torah has when, um, when it refers to Yaakov, that Yaakov um, was a traveling. It says, V'yaakov halach ledarko, that Yaakov went on his way. And this verse is often used at the end of the month of Tishrei. So that just the, the English translation is Jack hit the road. But... Uh, Yaakov went on his way, and many Jews around the world will announce it at the end of Tishrei. They'll say, Yaakov, it's time to go on our way. In other words, we have to take everything we packed in, because remember, we've learned a lot. We've experienced a lot. Elo, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. I mean, we've been at this people, friends for six weeks already, an hour a week, plus people, uh, some of you have listened to it more than once and reflect on it. It's been a full experience, and comes the end of this weekend and Shabbos Bereshis, and everything that culminates, and we wrap it, and we say, it's time to hit the road, time to bring this energy into real life, because there's so much to unpack. So what have you learned? What, what will stay with you? Please, God, all these year, and we'll stay on YouTube. You're, you'll, you can access them in the future years. Um, <clears throat> but more importantly, what, what are you taking? And what's this Chag going to change about you? Information is great, but information that leads to transformation is holy. And Torah is supposed to transform us. Torah, the word Torah means lesson. Torah has to be a manual, a lesson for life. It's supposed to teach us how we're supposed to live and we're supposed to adapt it. And I hope that going through this Tishrei experience from beginning to end this year has been a rewarding journey for you. It's been very rewarding for me. And... <clears throat> May we only celebrate simchas and good things. It's unfortunate that COVID was the only thing that was able to stimulate to bring this process, but please God, we, I plan on doing the DIY for the rest of the Chagim of the year as well. So when it comes to Hanukkah, we'll have a DIY Hanukkah, then we'll have a, a little bit of one part or two parts, a DIY Purim, maybe even a DIY Tubishvat, a DIY Pesach, a DIY Shavuot. We'll do it over the coming year so that we can actually just, you know, unpack the, all these mega days in the Jewish calendar. We could have DIY davening in general, daily davening, DIY Shabbos davening. You could send all your comments and requests forward. We'd love to be able to experience it together. And I just want to thank you all for doing this journey with us. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. And may Hashem watch us um, all. And I finish off by 
uh, sorry, I finished off. Oh, wow, I didn't even realize I, I finished exactly at the moment. 